Okay, so welcome to APA and MLA Basics, starting your paper and mastering the format. So this workshop uh, was intended just kind of to help people with the startup aspect of their uh, writing papers. So kind of where do you start? What do we do from the beginning? And I'm talking less about um, citations and references, but if you have questions about that, we can absolutely talk about that too. We do have a second workshop coming up next month. Um, that'll be focused mostly on citation and uh, references. So basically today we're gonna talk about these things, getting started, organizing, formatting, using quotes, very briefly about references and then time for questions, but please feel free to ask questions throughout if you have any that come up. So getting started sometimes is the hardest part for people. And I think that sometimes it feels more intimidating than it needs to, especially when you haven't written a paper in a while or it's a different formatting or a different topic that you are not used to writing about, it sometimes feels intimidating, but really most of the time the professors are just giving you very clear instructions on write this for me, talk to me about this topic. So if you think the most basic um, answer to the question is usually the one that they're looking for. They're not, they're not trying to trick you or ask you for something that's impossible, um, even though sometimes it feels that way. So the first thing is read the assignment, read it more than once, um, get any clarifications. A lot of professors go over those things in class and sometimes it's after you thought about what they've said, you have a question. So think about that. Um, and the next thing is just to start writing, even if it's not the best like, format or structure, even if you're just writing on paper, I think sometimes just getting some words down can be helpful because it helps you process. I still write on paper to start for my um, when I write and not everybody does that a lot of people do computer only but for me I tend to start I will even write a whole thing just in a notebook or on paper and it kind of helps me because when I go back through to type it in I kind of process some of the things that I've I've said and then see what I've missed um, but different people have different methods. So like whatever makes the most sense for you is what you should do. One thing that sometimes people come to the writing lab uh, for is to help with the formatting. And I've had people say, I decided I would put the paragraphs in later. Don't put the paragraphs in later. I don't understand paragraphs later. Do the paragraphs from the beginning. Do the formatting from the beginning. When you do that, uh, it makes it easier. Um, because it's one less thing that you need to worry about at the end. If you need help, ask for tutors, ask for librarians, ask your professor a question. They're happy to answer your questions. So definitely um, feel free to ask anybody that you um, can to um, give you a second opinion. When you come to the writing lab, a lot of times when I read papers, people are asking me, does it make sense? And I can say, yeah, it makes sense. Or, well, I'm having trouble following the second part of your argument. Or I feel like you could give me a little bit more um, backup for this idea. And so I think that sometimes a writing tutor is not so much about correcting your verbs or punctuation, but it, to give you a person to talk to about what you're working on. Sometimes that's, that's hard to find. Uh, your friends might not wanna talk about your academic paper. Um, and you can't necessarily have a, pre-feedback from a professor. You can ask pointed questions, but you know there's sometimes a limit on how much they can help you with an in-process assignment. So writing tutors can really help to just get an opinion on something. Uh, and a, an appointment can be a half hour, it can be 10 minutes, it can be very short. So that's uh, something to remember. And if you're doing something that's research-based and you're having trouble finding any of the sources, um, all of our librarians are also available online. So you can reach out to either of us um, groups through the um, website and logging in through my FSCJ online brain brain fuse online tutoring will get you to writing tutors the librarians are available through the library website so time management is also a really key aspect of working on a paper it seems obvious to say it and I know when I was a student I I always waited till the end I never followed my own instructions that I give people. Um, 
but it can be helpful if you give yourself at least enough time that you can sleep on your paper before you turn it in. So that way you can kind of think about it. Um, it sounds funny, but it, I think it actually helps sometimes to have that night in the morning, even if you have to turn it in the next morning, you can think about, oh, I forgot to include this, or you can have that few extra minutes to kind of proofread one more time and make sure you had everything um, changed that you wanted to change. Always try and give yourself the chance to proofread one last time, given some space from it, and then submit your paper. So, like I just was saying, when you're getting started, there's always that challenge of should I type, should I write, how do I do it, um, handwriting, whatever, but do what is best for you. Some people like outlines, some people don't find outlines that helpful, some classes um, provide some sort of like template to start, like a pre-writing activity and um, annotated bibliographies and those types of things where you're doing your research and you're kind of doing it in a, in a progressive way. That can be really great for some people. Other people don't find it as helpful. I tend to be a person who I amass any possible resource that I think I could use, piles of books and papers and websites and links, and I um, kind of sit with that. And then suddenly I start writing. So I have way more than I need, and it may not be the most efficient method, but for me, that's how I tend to work, and I know that I do that. So. I tend to give myself the time to amass all of these things before jumping in. And then that way you can see what's missing and see weed out what isn't going to be helpful for you. And the other thing I also do is write my reference list or work cited list from the very beginning. So that way, after you've kind of probably pushed your limits and you're kind of reaching the end of your time to write something and your patience to detail, You've already done all the citations in, you, in the list of your references, so you don't have to worry about those picky details at the end, because that can be kind of a frustrating activity. For me, I find it kind of soothing, and so when I do it as I um, compile things, that makes it a little bit easier. So the first thing that you're going to do in a paper, any paper, no matter how you're going to, whatever style it is, whether it's science or humanities, you're going to write a thesis statement, which very you know, standard uh, idea tells the reader what you're talking about. But there are good thesis statements and there are not so good thesis statements. So a thesis statement should tell your reader what you're talking about, but it should also give that little bit more. So from reading your thesis statement, which is just basically a sentence, I should know what's going to happen in the in the rest of the paper. So if I read a thesis statement and it says, Dogs are great pets. That's the topic of your paper. I know that your paper is going to be about dogs, but I don't necessarily know what's going to follow. Why are they great pets? Um, something better might be dogs are great pets because they're loyal, they um, live a long time, and they're friendly. You know, so then I know that your argument is going to follow that that sort of path. And so that's very key in a thesis statement that you're giving more than the topic, you're giving more information. So you're answering a specific question uh, and you're giving a way for people to understand that idea. Sometimes there are different types of essays. So if it's research, it might be different than a persuasive essay. So if you're compiling research about uh, a specific type of vaccine or something you're going to have that's going to look different than if you're saying why people should or should not take a vaccine so the type of paper that you're writing will also kind of guide how your thesis statement will be written so the important thing to think of is that if your thesis statement is giving you a roadmap you actually follow it so if you give me a list of things that will prove your thesis i want to follow that in a list um, another thing i always like to point out when we're talking about the beginning of a paper is that sometimes things change. So you have a thesis statement. Most of the time your thesis statement stays the same. Sometimes it's easy to get stuck in the introduction of a paper because what happens in the introduction is kind of a little bit of background leading up to what your ultimate thesis is. And sometimes that introduction is hard to write. I find an introduction to be one of the more challenging aspects of a paper because it's giving kind of background information, but not getting too involved. And sometimes it's helpful. You need a thesis in the beginning, but sometimes you can leave the introduction to the end of your writing. 
or just admit that or know that you may make changes to your um, introductory paragraph or paragraphs because it can change over the course of writing. So when you're looking at your thesis and thinking about it, good way to kind of evaluate it is to ask yourself some questions. Are you answering the question? Compare it with the assignment and what you were asked to do. Um, have I taken a position that others may challenge or oppose? This might be for a more persuasive kind of essay, but also a way to think about that is, is it interesting? Will people care? So does it pass the so what test? So if some, if you state what your thesis is, are people going to say, I don't care, or so what? Can you answer the, can you answer the question, so what? Um, then when you go through your essay, is it supporting your thesis? Sometimes it's easy, especially with larger topics that you can get, you can go off on a separate little path that maybe that, that one little comment is helpful, but if you get completely derailed into a different topic, that's not supporting your thesis anymore. And then finally, are you answering how and why? Are you um, answering the questions that your reader wants to um, know the answer to? So this thesis, social media is good and bad. What do you think, good or bad thesis? Oh, social media is good or bad. Um, that's not a good thesis. It's not so great because, well, number one, something that's so obvious, like something is good and bad. That's probably yeah. true about everything in the world, right? So um, we want something that's more developed than that. Um, and I've actually, I've read theses like this. And to me, I say, and the thing is about a thesis, oftentimes people will write a not so strong thesis, but the paper itself is actually very good. They just didn't include enough yeah. in the thesis. So sometimes that's really the problem. It's not that you didn't have the idea or you didn't have the thesis, you just didn't put it in the paper. So I think that that's something to always think about too. So this obviously is an updated version and it's uh, longer and kind of still brings in that idea of good and bad, but there's more to it. Social media can bring both benefits and harms to society because of the vast amount of information, the complexity of analyzing data, and the comforting anonymity of being online. So now we're still talking about how it's good and bad. It's not a clear good or bad thing, but these are the reasons why it's good and bad. And so a good thesis is going to give us a because in there somewhere. You don't always have to have the word because, but it's very common to see a because in a thesis statement. So final things when you're kind of thinking about the writing process itself, uh, remember who your audience is. So you need to remember that when you're writing a paper, you should write it as if the person who's reading it doesn't really know anything about the topic or just knows the basics. So clearly you're writing for your professor and your professor knows the topic and you know the topic. You should still provide some of that background information so that anyone who reads it could get something out of the paper and could understand. At the same time, you don't want to provide every single background detail that exists. Then you end up with a uh, paper that's uh, kind of confusing and probably much larger in scope than what the intention was. Most of the time, you're going to avoid saying I, we, you. Exceptions, of course, for different types of essays, personal essays, reflection essays about yourself, those things, sometimes you have I or your um, professor will give you a specific direction about using that. But generally try to use the third person. You can do that, um, use the third person by saying, you know, he, she, they, but you can also include generic kind of people names or people groups, people, students, uh, doctors, students, whatever the group is that you're writing about, uh, you can use those types of nouns as well. Review the assignment and the guidance provided by your instructor. I always advise people to kind of review that again once they review it before they start, but review it in the middle too, just so that way you keep yourself on track. It's surprising how people can get off track when doing writing um, because the ideas are there, you have the intention, and then suddenly you've written something completely different. Give yourself time to reflect so you can do final read through and get an extra set of eyes, whether it's a writing tutor or your roommate, anyone 
an extra set of eyes can give you can ask you that question of I didn't understand when you said this or oh you're missing a period those small things can make a big difference to you and sometimes when we're writing we start to fill in the things that are missing so if you're writing about a topic you know more about that topic than I do so if you were writing it you're kind of writing it with those ideas in mind and so if I read it I don't have those ideas in mind either. Um, so I can say, I need to know a little bit more about X in order to fully understand. And so that's what um, a, a writing tutor or a second reader can do for you. So now a more picky kind of aspect of writing is formatting. Uh, MLA is used for a lot of the papers that we see in um, undergraduate work, sometimes uh, APA and MLA are used interchangeably. Some professors ask for either or. Some are more specific about APA um, or MLA. Neither of them are more difficult or more um, simple. It's just a little bit different. And so it's managing kind of those small differences, especially if you intend to be in a course a humanities course and a social science course, and you have to do MLA in one and APA in another, that can be a lot to juggle sometimes. Um, oh, no, that's gosh. another great reason to come to the writing lab because we're used to doing that. So we can help you quickly spot where the little um, points are that you yeah. need to change. So MLA, you don't have a title page. It's one inch margins, 12 point font. That's pretty standard for APA as well. Um, you do have a title page in APA though. So you, the main things are your name, instructor name, course and date, the centered title, and then start the paper. I have a sample of what that would look like. So a, an MLA paper has your last name and the page number starting from page one. You can put that in the header. I always remind people you have to change the font in the header yourself manually, otherwise it will be the default font that Word is in to start with. So it's usually a Calibri font, and so you can tell the difference if you use times in the um, main body of the text. An MLA paper starts from the very first line through the end without any extra spaces. It's just double spaced the entire way. There's no extra bolding or anything like that. So this is what it would look like in a, for an MLA paper on the first page. And any subsequent pages, you still just have the header that automatically puts it, um, enters that in for you. When you get to the end of the paper, you do your work cited on a second page or on the next new page. You center the, the title, work cited, and then you have different, um, you have an alphabetical list of all your sources. There's different, um, requirements for different types of sources, whether it's a website or a book or an online journal or a magazine. Um, and that's something we'll, I'll cover in the next workshop. APA, very similar in terms of spacing and margins, font, indentation, do the same sort of thing. Although APA does have a few extra things, APA is often used for in, in the sciences and social sciences. And so because of the research basis, I think there's a little bit more structure to it. Um, for student papers, the newest <laughs> version of APA, APA 7, has made it a little, has simplified it a little bit for student papers. So for your uh, title page, starting about in the middle, this is what a page would, a title page would look like. You give your, uh, title in bold, and then name, college, class, professor, and date. Now, often professors will tell you what information they would like you to include on your title page. So that's kind of something to look for in the assignment. Um, and you may or may not have to include FSCJ. You may or may not have to include the course name. But that those are kind of a basic way to start that. So then on your first page of the body of the paper, you're going to put your, your title bolded, centered, and then you start right into your, um, your discussion the same way you would with MLA. Um, yeah, Lisa, yeah. those highlighted um, 
citations are mm -hmm. they supposed to be highlighted like that on paper no it, they're not supposed to be highlighted like that they did it to kind of oh, print it out for people yeah they it's okay. this was a sample paper so you wouldn't highlight anything in your papers um but that right there is an example of an in-text citation so in apa you give the author which here it's the apa and then date or the year and then page number if there is a page number um in mla it's just the author and the page number if there is one now because so many of our things are online often we don't have page numbers in in our citations but we always have an author of some sort and likely a year um, even though sometimes the year is hard to find um one small difference in APA is that sometimes people might have an abstract or a keyword section. Some professors will require that, others will not. Abstract. So, so that's something to pay attention to. An abstract is would be the second page, so that would be page two, and it's a short summary of what your entire paper is about. So um, if it's about COVID vaccines, you would say something like, um, you know, COVID, the COVID pandemic has changed everyone's lives. And what has been very interesting is the development of vaccines in such a quick time. These are the vaccines. This paper will discuss which vaccine is best or whatever the goal of the paper is. But it's very short, maybe 150 words, something like that. And then the keyword section is just under the abstract on the same page and keywords would be like the most important. Um, if you were to search that paper, these are the words that would be most important. So COVID, maybe vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, those types of things. So not all professors require that for uh, the papers that we have at FSCJ, but sometimes they do. And that's all that is, is a brief summary of your paper. And so then you would start the body of the paper on page three. Um, at the end of an APA paper, it's a reference page instead of a works cited page. So this is the same idea. You have an alphabetical listing of all of the sources. Here, this was a great sample paper I found because it had some examples that are different. So there was a book is the first one, uh, a report, and then a journal article. So this is what they would generally look like. But again, the next um, workshop will cover more about the specific um, mechanics of citations, but you'll always have a reference list and a works cited list and include that at the end of your paper, because that's where people, your reader can find the details about things you've mentioned within your paper. Because within your paper, anytime you're quoting something, you're gonna give that source. Which brings me to this section on quotations. Quotes should support your argument. They should not be your argument. I once read a paper that it was a 10 page paper and I believe that there were literally 10 sentences in the paper. The rest of them were quotes. So if you were averaging a sentence of your own a page, you are quoting too much. Um, so what you need to work on when you're including citations and references to support your argument is that how much is it just kind of informing what you are pulling together yourself versus the importance of it being a specific statement from another source? So often anything that has a number or statistics, years, that kind of stuff, probably automatically is going to have a, a in-text citation because you wouldn't know those specific things off the top of your head. Anything that you wouldn't just know from living life in the world you're going to have a citation for. But also if you're giving specific information or if um, an author has written something in a very specific way that you would like to include that, that's perfectly fine. So you want to think about what your sources are. Uh, we have tons of e-resources um, right now. We have um, many, many academic journals and publications and also books that you can access through the FSCJ library without having to come into the library. And librarians, are you can't even click onto the site without getting a 
notified that a librarian is available to help you. So always help, ask them for help because they know the best way to search for everything. Um, and remember that your your quotes are supposed to support what you're saying. So your voice should be heard above the voices of other people that you're um, using to help um, support your ideas. So if you use quotes, try not to exceed more than 40 words in APA or more than four lines in MLA. That's about the same length. Uh, there's special formatting that's required once you get to a certain length of quote. And most of the time, instructors don't like to see those quotes unless there's a really good reason for them. The other thing about quotes is that you want to in explain why they're in your paper. So if you just drop in a, a quote without any context or explanation, I don't know what you're, I don't know the reason for that. And so I shouldn't have to do all of the work as the reader to understand why you're including that information. So you can sprinkle it in, or these are some methods, sprinkling or blending. So this is kind of including it within the middle of a sentence. The film redefined expectations of independent film because they, quote, exemplified new dramatic technologies and earned numerous Oscars. So that's an example of when you just take a small piece of what someone has said, but it's a very specific expression. So you include that as a quote. You can use an introductory phrase, according to a specific person, something is happening. So that's more for a, an entire sentence that you might include. Um, you can also use this idea of Samantha Harden explains that, uh, defines that, any of those words that kind of are synonyms to explain, define, says, states, those types of things. You wanna try and mix that up too, so it looks different. It's nice to incorporate quotes in different ways. Also, you'll notice at the end of these quotes, there's another sentence that kind of follows up. So in that final example, Samantha Harden explains that our concern about climate change is real and increasing. Harden and others point to the recent increase in tropical weather as just one example. So that follow up sentence is explaining kind of why it's important that her quote was included. You can split the quote. So if there's Sometimes with longer quotes from someone, you don't necessarily need to include 100 words that someone else said if really what you want are 20 words that they said. And you can split that up a little bit as long as you're not uh, changing what the quote is intended to say. And then you could also very um, like more directly use a colon, which is, uh, I guess, another version of using a that. So when you're using quotes, Provide a context to build it up. Say who's telling us, whether it's the person is included in your sentence or whether it's in the um, in-text citation, and then explain the importance. And always remember to include your in-text citation. A lot of professors require Turnitin. If you're using Turnitin, sometimes Turnitin will do a better or worse job of noticing when you've done in-text citations. So sure, you may have direct quotes from someone else in your paper, but that doesn't mean you've plagiarized. It just means that you've quoted them and that there's there should be an in-text citation. So sometimes Turnitin will notice that as a uh, plagiarism or potential plagiarism, but it's really not. So that's something to pay attention to when you're kind of working on that as well. So at the end of your paper, you're going to be thinking about how to conclude. Conclusions are, can be challenging, just like an introduction, because you don't want to introduce anything new in a conclusion. You don't want to just restate entirely what you had in your introduction, but you want to give kind of a, a parting thought. So again, this depends on what type of paper you're writing. If it's a research paper that you're proving a certain idea, you're going to want to state that. Um, Maybe not exactly the same way as you stated it in your thesis, but in a very similar way. So again, you're gonna to wanna to answer that question, so what? So at the end of your paper, I wanna know, do you know why you wrote this paper? So return to the beginning themes or in the introduction. Sometimes if you started with an example, you can return to that example at the end of your paper. It just depends on what the topic is. Synthesize, don't summarize. So you don't need to repeat your entire paper, but 
just kind of pull together some of the ideas that were important overall. If there, sometimes it's appropriate to have like a quotation or a specific perspective from your research or reading, uh, but you don't want to rely on what other people are saying. The part of the importance of your paper is your voice. So use that kind of sparingly. Maybe you have like a call to action or a solution or an idea for further research. That could be a way to conclude. Or you could point to how that um, would be impactful for the word, world at large, kind of even beyond the scope of your paper. So if you were writing about um, a paper about COVID vaccines, in your conclusion, you're, you might mention that, you know, this process of developing a vaccine quickly and um, distributing it to millions and millions of people um, has broader implications because um, governments can learn and be prepared next time, you know, if this ever were to happen again or something like that. So that's kind of taken outside the scope of a paper about COVID, but you're talking about the idea of a pandemic and vaccines. So finally, you're going to have your references page and works cited page, which that is um, coming up in a month. And at the same time, sometimes these workshops are hard to attend. So I do we do uh, record them. But also, if you have any questions about any of these writing issues, you can always make an appointment with a tutor. We have FSCJ tutors available seven days a week. So again, to access FSCJ writing tutors, you log into my FSCJ. And then online tutor, online brain fuse tutoring, and then you select through tutor match. It's a purple box in the set, center of the page. That will have a uh, topic and subject. So you select English and writing to get a writing tutor, and then from there it's a fairly um, intuitive process where you select date, time, tutor, uh, and then you'll get notifications in your email. And the time of your appointment, you'll log back into BrainFuse and you'll be able to access your appointment that way. So finally, what I would say about getting started and writing is to just start. It's easy to think this is a lot. I don't know what to do. Even before you kind of do your research, I think sometimes it's helpful to kind of write your ideas and where you think you want to head. So that way, when you go to do research, you can already have that basis. And then start from the beginning and ask questions when you need help. In an ideal world, people could bring drafts to me. So I see your first draft. I can help you kind of see where you might want to make some changes or some work. Then you work on it and then you bring it back to me and I look at it a second time. Time management doesn't always allow for that because everybody's really busy. But if you have small questions while you're writing, you can always meet with a tutor even for a few minutes to ask those specific questions. And as I said, we are available seven days a week and we have quite a few tutors. So there's usually someone always available for um, appointments. Even if we logged in right now, I'm sure there's probably 10 people available to take an appointment right now. So I think um, having the availability of somebody to talk to about it is really important. And here are some of the sources that I use to prepare this uh, presentation. I'm happy to send this out to you if you'd like an email of it, so that way you can have the resources on it. Um, and my contact information was on the previous page. Um, any questions? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I hope this was helpful. And definitely, if you think of something later, um, feel free to reach out. Um, available all the time and um, other writing tutors are too. All right.